Good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Baptist Church. If this is your first time joining us this morning, I'm so very glad that you're joining us today. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing How Great Thou Art. Sing it from your heart. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider What a great song. Aren't you glad God is good? Amen. He's not just good, he's great. And uh, man, what, what a privilege it is to be called a child of God and uh, to be part of his family. And we're so glad to see you here this morning and looking forward to a, a good service today. And of course, today uh, we'll be honoring our veterans, those who have served uh, in our, for our country. Uh, how many, just, just real quick, how many veterans do we have here this morning? If you just raise your hand. All right, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I think about eight or nine. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. And in a few minutes, we're going to have a special time just to recognize you and, and honor you and just say thank you uh, for your service, for our country, uh, for the freedoms we're able to enjoy today. Uh, but let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer and just ask the Lord to bless uh, our service today. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you uh, that we can come today and just, uh, Lord, worship you. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that you are a great God, and uh, Lord, you're so good to us. Lord, just to be able to come this morning and sing praises to you, we ask that you would be honored and uh, glorified in all that is done in the special music, and uh, Lord, our giving, even the preaching this morning, uh, Lord, that the message would be used to speak to hearts, and Lord, that you would draw us closer to you. And Lord, we do pray if there might be someone today that uh, may not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Uh, Lord, you'd help them to realize that Jesus uh, loves them and he gave his life for them and he's willing to forgive them of their sins if they'll just uh, repent of them and put their faith and trust in him. And uh, Lord, he'll give them that gift of eternal life. And so, Father, we do ask that you just bless in our service today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated this morning and the choir is going to sing for us. Was 
guilty everyone could see but his destiny was changed as he looked at christ and said when your kingdom comes remember me in paradise that day he stood just like the lord had said he would surrounded by the that some of us came by the way of the cross. Amen. Amen. Through that, we have victory in Jesus. And that's the next song we're going to be singing. Let's all stand together. I heard an old, old story how the Savior came from glory. Sing it out. Sing it strong this morning. I heard an old, old story how the Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like about his groaning of his precious blood atoning then I repented of my sin and won the victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior forever he sought me and he bought me with his he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing of his cleansing. 
cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victor sing it out on that chorus oh victory my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about good this morning church amen oh say but i'm glad because we have victory we have gladness in our hearts today there is a song in my heart today something i never had jesus has taken my sins away tunnels the soul can see. Oh, say that I'm glad. Oh, say that I'm glad, I'm glad. Oh, say that I'm glad. Jesus has come and my cup's overrun. Oh, say that I'm glad. Oh, won't you come to him with all your care, weary and worn and sad. You too will sing and love you share. Amen. What great singing this morning, and uh, we're so uh, thankful to be able to give praise back to the Lord and uh, just for all that He's done for us, and we're thankful for that. Um, do want to make mention, of course, just a couple of things as we get ready to have uh, the ushers come and take up our offering in just a moment, um, and I think we have uh, a special treat for you this morning uh, for the uh, offering. We have a uh, brass quartet that is going to be playing for us. So uh, if the guys want to go ahead and uh, come up and get ready for that. Uh, but of course, don't forget, uh, we have our missions conference coming up next Sunday. And so what a, uh, that's always such an encouraging time and looking forward to our missions conference. And uh, so uh, we do have a schedule. Uh, if you did not get one, uh, they'll be on the back table there, a schedule uh, of everything that's going to be going on during the missions conference, who will be speaking where they'll be speaking, especially on Sunday when we have the different classes and things. And then also, um, like on Sunday night, of course, don't forget we have the international taste testing. That's going to be great. I hope you'll bring something for that. Uh, bring something unique, right? You say, if I bring something unique, will you eat it? 
That depends. <laughs> Normally, I would say yes, because there's not much I haven't eaten before, but I will put a little asterisk right there and say that depends on what it is. Um, but uh, that's going to be a great time of fellowship. And then throughout the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 7 o'clock each night. Uh, and I know uh, with those that are working and things like that, that makes for a long week, but do the very best that you can to be here each service. I know you'll be blessed by it uh, and all that these missionaries are doing and some that are going. Uh, and then on the back, it also sh- uh, we have a list of all of our missionaries that we support. And uh, we, I believe we support almost 75 missionaries. And, uh, and so it's listed by uh, the countries that they are in. So make sure you get one of those so you can maybe use that as a prayer list or something. Be praying for uh, those different missionaries there. And uh, looking forward to a great missions conference. And, uh, of course, on that Tuesday, we do have the ladies' luncheon. And so ladies, all the ladies are welcome to come out for that on Tuesday uh, at 11 a.m. And there is child care provided for that. So ladies, uh, please uh, come out for that. And I know you'll be blessed to get to know the missionary wives a little bit better and maybe even uh, learn maybe how to pray for them more. Uh, A lot of times we think of just the missionaries as far as the preachers are concerned. Uh, but the wives and the children, they need prayer just as much as, as the missionary himself. And so they, they're doing it as a team effort. Uh, it's not just the missionary going by himself. Uh, the wife and the children, they're all part of that missionary team. And so we want to pray for them. And uh, ladies, I know that will be a blessing. Now, uh, before Sunday, there are a few things that we would like to get done around the church. We have a few walls that kind of need to be uh, washed a little bit and, uh, and a few other things. And so if you're interested in helping any time throughout this week, maybe doing a little bit of cleaning, nothing really major. We're not painting or uh, doing anything like that, but we just want to get some things clean before uh, the missions conference. So if you're interested in helping with that, uh, if you could let me know after the service and we'll figure out when you can come in and do that and we would sure appreciate that. All right. Uh, Brother Andy Kud, would you come and uh, bless our offering this morning and uh, then we'll have this uh, great brass quartet play for us this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to assemble this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us and for life through Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you just bless this offering, bless the service to follow. We thank you for all this in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Amen. What a great job. I think that's the first time you guys have ever played together, right? As far as uh, they've practiced, but the first time they've played, and uh, we'll be selling CDs afterwards in the back. <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> no, they did a great job. I appreciate them putting that together. And uh, uh, I know there are others, and we're looking forward to, if you know how to play an instrument or something, please let us know and uh, use that talent, use that ability for the Lord. And uh, that's why God gave it to you, right? Don't just keep it to yourself. Uh, use it for the Lord and for His honor and glory. You say, well, I just don't play the best, and it's all right. It's okay. Uh, you know, a lot of us don't sing the best, right? And we still sing, you know, and uh, well, some of us try maybe, right? I don't know, but, uh, but no, please do that, and we'd love to uh, be able to have you uh, work with them and uh, even during the uh, songs and things like that be able to play and so what a great job. Well as we think about uh, I know in just a couple of days we have uh, I think it's the 11th uh, this Wednesday is Veterans Day and uh, we always do want to take time to recognize and honor those who have have served our country. This year we did something a little different. We actually had them bring some different things, uh, maybe that they had from when they were serving, uh, and we set up a little display table back there. I'd encourage you to go back and, uh, and look at it. Uh, some old pictures uh, of some guys that you'd be like, I wonder who that is. So I'm not going to say anything, but you got to figure it out. Uh, but some great uh, pictures and things like that and some uh, memorabilia and things. And so I encourage you to go back. Medals uh, there's several uh, different medals and things back there from men that, that served. And so we're just very thankful uh, for men and women who are willing to, to give their life uh, and to serve our country. Uh, you know, it's not easy being willing to be away from uh, home and be away from family uh, for, for months at a time and things like that, maybe sometimes even years uh, at a time. And of course, uh, obviously we know many uh, not just uh, sacrificed in, in going, but many even giving their lives uh, for the country and for our freedom that we enjoy today. And uh, I know, uh, please understand, we do not do this to embarrass anyone. We're not trying to embarrass anyone by doing this. In fact, I know every one of these men would say we would rather you uh, not say anything. Uh, but I believe the Bible is clear that we are to give honor to whom honor is due. And these are men and women, uh, we have women serving in our armed forces as well, uh, that have sacrificed so that we can enjoy uh, the freedoms that we have today. And, uh, and we appreciate them so much. And these, uh, these are our American heroes. And uh, these are men that we ought to be thankful for and women that we ought to be thankful for that are willing to, uh, to sacrifice and, uh, and so we're very, very thankful. And so if you are a veteran here this morning, if I could get you maybe just to come to the front, we have a special gift we'd like to give to you in just recognition of your service uh, for our country. And I know, uh, again, uh, this is not done to, uh, to embarrass them in any way, uh, but just to honor them and to say thank you uh, for their service in, in all they have done. And we have many that have done that. Come, come over around this guy. Steve, uh, Ross, why don't you come over this side? Come over this side here. Watch the ramp there. And um, we just, uh, we appreciate all of our men and women who serve. And again, as I said, please go back there and, and look at some of these things that they brought in. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we appreciate the men and women who serve in our armed forces and uh, those that uh, may are not serving anymore but have served and uh, given so much for our country. And so we just want to say thank you uh, just as a small token uh, of our appreciation from First Baptist Church, just to say thank you for your service. Don, thank you so much. God bless you. I saw that back there. They, uh, Brother Don and his family, they, uh, if you look back there, there is a, uh, an, an article. It's framed. It's from 1889. Um, and there are four generations of his family that has served in the military, and one of those papers goes, goes all the way back to 1889. I saw one of them, uh, one of the papers, uh, the date of birth was uh, 1922, I think it was. I think I saw 1922, and uh, so men that have served, and so we are so appreciative of that. Rob, thank you. God bless you. Uh, Dad, thank you. Amen. Uh, I, I, I challenge you to figure out which, um, which picture are these guys back there, because it's uh, going to be very kind but they don't look the same. <laughs> Ron, thank you. God bless you. Thank you for serving our country. And can we give them a round of applause and just say thank you? Amen. God bless you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Rodan. God bless you. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And after the service, we have a stack of cards that our young people have made uh, to say thank you. And so those uh, of you that are veterans, uh, as we leave today, we'll make sure to have those ready for you. Um, but we want, we want our folks to know that we appreciate uh, those that have served our country. And uh, we love them and we appreciate them very much. Brother Don said, that coat does not fit anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's, that's great. Amen. Well, this morning, um, this morning I was planning on continuing our study through, uh, through the book of Galatians and continuing through Galatians chapter 6. And um, last night I was ready and prepared. And um, in the middle of the night, it's just like God just woke me up and put a thought on my mind. And I uh, was thinking about it in the night, and uh, even this morning after I, after I went back to sleep and woke up again, uh, that thought was there, and so I, I changed the message uh, this morning, and I'd like for us to turn to the book of Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the perks of being a pastor is you can change a message anytime you want to, right? <laughs> Exodus chapter 32 and um, in verse number one, we'll begin reading Exodus chapter number 32 in verse number one. It says, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people brake off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and uh, brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves and have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it. And have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. I, I like that. God is telling Moses up on the mountain what the people are actually saying, right? We find what the people are saying in a few verses previous to that, but God's telling Moses, This is what they're saying, okay? Um, again, God, God knows everything. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff necked people. Now please watch verse number 10. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. I'll make of thee a great nation. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that we can come this morning and worship you, and thank you for the great singing and the special music and the, uh, the, the brass quartet that played, and uh, Lord, just people using their abilities and talents for the Lord, and we thank you for that. And Father, I pray that this morning that you would just be honored and glorified in all that is said and done. Lord, even the message this morning, I pray that you use it to speak to hearts, Lord, even as you've used it to speak to mine this morning as well. And Father, I pray that you just draw us closer to you. Lord, work as only you can today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm so thankful for these men who we just recognized and honored who've served our great country um, and many who are currently serving all around the world uh, standing for life and for freedom and for our freedom as a country i'm thankful that there are men and women who are willing to stand in the gap for freedom they've been willing and are willing to make sacrifices so that we can enjoy the freedom that we have 
These are not the only ones that I would say that stand in the gap, though. We're thankful for our military who stand in the gap, protecting us from other countries and being willing to do that. But may I say that they are not the only ones standing in the gap. May I say that we need pastors who will stand in the gap for their people. We need parents who will stand in the gap for their children. We need families who will stand in the gap for their country. We need Christians who will stand in the gap for a lost and dying world. I want you to hold your place here in Exodus chapter 32. We're going to come back to it. I want you to look with me in the book of Psalms chapter 106. Psalms chapter 106. We're not going to read the whole psalm here, but it's kind of a rehearsal of what we find in the book of Exodus is God leading the children of Egypt, or excuse me, leading the children of Israel out of Egypt and all that is being done. But I want you to notice a specific verse here in Psalms chapter 106, in verse um, number 23. Verse number 23. Therefore, he, being God, said that he would destroy them, Israel. Had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. What we find here in Psalms chapter 106 and verse 23 is what we're seeing in Exodus chapter 32. God says, I am ready to destroy this people. They're such a stiff-necked people. I'm ready to destroy them, but yet... He tells us here, he says, that had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him, stood before God in the breach, in the breach, in the gap that was there. If Moses had not stood in the gap, then God says he would have destroyed his people, right? Now, think about this, and let's go back to Exodus chapter 32 now. And this morning, I I want to preach a message called Standing in the Gap, because this is what we find Moses doing. Moses stood in the gap between God and the children of Israel. Uh, These men that we have seen today and and recognized and honors, they are men and there are women who are willing to stand in the gap between our country and, and those that would want to destroy our country. They're willing to stand in the gap. And so I want to notice, first of all, the situation that we have here in Exodus chapter 32. In Exodus chapter 32, here is God's chosen people at the base of Mount Sinai. So get the picture. They have left Egypt. God has delivered them from the Egyptians by the ten plagues, and they come to the Red Sea, and God opens up the Red Sea, and they walk through on dry ground, and uh, God has been Uh, leading them and even when there was no food and no water God provides food and water for them and so then they come to Mount Sinai here and they're at the base of Mount Sinai and Moses the the man of God has been up on Mount Sinai receiving all the words of God now a lot of times we just think that Moses was up there and God gave him the Ten Commandments and that was pretty much it right Uh, If you actually go back, you'll find that Moses goes up on Mount Sinai in chapter 24. We're in chapter 32, and he still hasn't come down yet, right? Moses goes up in chapter 24. It's not just the Ten Commandments, but all of the things that you begin to read about the tabernacle and about all the, the dietary laws and all of these things. God is giving all of these words to Moses while he's up on Mount Sinai. It wasn't just Ten Commandments. I don't think it would have taken very long just to give the Ten Commandments, right? But all of these laws that they're going to begin governing God's people, Israel, God is giving them to Moses. And so he's been up there for 40 days now. He's been up there for 40 days. Uh, Again, you go all the way back to chapters 24 all the way through 31. It's all God speaking to Moses on the mountain. So it's been about 40 days and the people are starting to wonder what happened to Moses, Where is he at? What happened to him? I mean, we saw him go up, but he hasn't come back down. And the people are getting a little bit restless, and they begin to wonder what happened to the man of God. They're getting very anxious. And notice what it says here in verse number 1. 
It says, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this, man, or for this Moses, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. So think about this. They're saying, hey, Moses has been up there for 40 days. Uh, you know, he's probably dead. So Aaron, you need to make us gods that are going to lead us into the promised land. And I, I know sometimes we, we start thinking that they have just totally turned their backs on God right? I mean, they're, they're wanting to worship an idol, and they're, they're wanting to worship this golden calf that Aaron makes. I want to take a little bit of a step back here and say, I don't think they've completely turned their back on God, because watch what Aaron says, right? In verse number five, when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. He didn't say tomorrow is a feast to this golden calf. He said tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. So what's happening? Well, again, get, get, the, get the picture. Think about what is happening here. And, and we'll begin to see this in just a moment. But the children of Israel have begun equating, and think about what they said in verse number one, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt. Who are they saying brought us up out of the land of Egypt? Moses. And what begins, now they know it was God. They know God did it, but they are beginning to equate a man with God. So watch what happens here, right? So what happens when the man that they're equating to be with God, right? I mean, Moses is the one that led us out. Moses is the one that's done this. And they're equating Moses with the man of, as, as God. Moses kind of equal with God. And so Moses goes up to uh, the mountain, and he's there for 40 days. They don't know what's happened. And notice what they said. They said, uh, um, they said to Aaron, make us gods which shall go before us. What are they trying to say? They said, we can't see God. We can't see him. And so what we want you to do, Aaron, because Moses, we were kind of looking at Moses like God. So we were following him, but now Moses is gone. So we need something else that we can follow. We need something else. And so Moses or Aaron makes something for us. And so Aaron makes the calf. And again, yes, they are worshiping the calf, but they're worshiping the calf as the Lord. They're saying this is this calf is now equal to the Lord. This is the one that's going to take us into the land. Right? So you see what's happening here. They, they really don't have a good foundation on who God is. They, they know about him. They've heard about him. And Moses is supposed to be up there on the mountain uh, speaking with God. And they've seen the power of God. They've seen him open up the Red Sea. They've seen the miracles of the plagues. They've seen the, the, the water and they've seen the, the food being provided. But who is this God? And what begins to happen is because... They do not have a good foundation of who God is because they're not willing to trust what they cannot see. They begin putting their trust in that which they can see. Moses. And when Moses goes off the scene, now it must be, we have to have something else, so let's make an idol. And now they're putting their trust in something they can't see. And here's, here's the problem, right? Right? When we are not putting our faith in God who we cannot see, when we're saying, hey, we have to have something to see. Maybe, and I, I hope this is not the way it is in your life, but, you know, we have to see our pastor and he has to be the one leading us and he has to be the one guiding us. Or, or if it's not the pastor, okay, we got to find somebody else. We've got to find somebody else to lead us and to guide us. Wait a minute, hold on. What was Israel's problem? They did not have that good foundation. They did not have that trust in God whom they could not see. And what did that lead to? Watch what begins to happen. It says in verse number 37, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Watch. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. By the way, if you remember... The Ten Commandments were actually given back in Exodus chapter 20 before Moses goes up to Mount Sinai. Moses doesn't go up to Mount Sinai until Exodus chapter 24. The Ten Commandments are given in Exodus chapter 20. So God has already given them instruction on what he expects of them. 
But instead of following God and trusting God and looking to God, they started looking to something that they can see. Do you know what's sad is that there are many Christians today who are absolutely just devastated. Right now, today, there are many Christians that are absolutely just devastated today because of the election. Why? Because they put their eyes on an office. They put their eyes on a man instead of putting their eyes on God. Their eyes are not on God where they're supposed to be. It really, and please, please understand what I'm saying here. It really doesn't matter who becomes president because God is still on the throne. And so many times, though, we let, just like Israel, we let the situation that we're in, oh, man, what's happening? We don't understand what's going on, and and, and we thought this was right, and we thought this person was doing well, and and maybe, you know, maybe maybe you've been in a church before, and maybe the, man, the pastor was the one that you followed, and then all of a sudden, maybe he messed up or something, and it's like, oh, no, we've got to find someone else, and and so we're going to put somebody else in there, or, or maybe just turn completely away from God. Why do these things happen? Because Christians do not have a good foundation in trusting God. Look, if we want to be able to accomplish what God wants, and we're going to, and this is all really just kind of introduction right now, we have to be willing to trust Him. We have to be willing to say, look, it doesn't matter. Yes, look, we can, we can cast a vote and we have the privilege and the responsibility to do that. But God is still on the throne no matter what happens. He's still in charge. This did not take God by surprise. So instead of worrying and fretting and and all of these things, we just have to go back and look to God again. Let's take our eyes off of a man. Let's take our eyes off of an office. Let's take our eyes off of a calf. And let's get them back on God. I want you to notice the second thing here. You say, what does this have to do with standing in the gap? (laughs) Glad you asked. You were thinking that, weren't you? What does it have to do with this? I want you to notice the second thing, and that is the test. The situation here is that Israel has kind of turned away from God. But then there's a test that takes place. Verse number seven, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down for And I want you to notice the phrasing here. Thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Interesting. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, now watch this. I have seen this people. And behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. What is going on? God says, Moses, go down. Man, they have they've turned away. They're, they've turned quickly away. And he says, go down and confront them. He says, I'm going to destroy them. And then he uses this phrase, I will make of thee a great nation. I'll make of thee a great nation. God says that he sees the hardening of the people. And he says something very interesting here. And I know many have said that God was offering Moses to be a great nation and make something out of him. But I think we miss what was actually happening here. For 40 years of Moses' life, it was all about Moses. 40 years. It's all been about Moses. The first 40 years of his life. Remember? He grows up. He's raised in Pharaoh's household as the son of Pharaoh. He has the best education. 
Everything, I mean, he's 40 years old. Think of all that he must have learned. He knows that he is a Jew. He knows that he's a Hebrew. And he knows that there is supposed to be someone to deliver them. And so what does he do? Moses says, I will be the deliverer. Who better than me? I mean, I have all this education. I have all of this uh, skill. No doubt he was probably trained in warfare and things. He's like, I have all of this knowledge. Who better than me to deliver Israel? And if you think about that, you remember what happened. Israel rejected him from being the deliverer. The first part of this verse, I think, shows us that God is testing Moses to see if he still thinks that he is somebody. Here's the test. Now, therefore, and watch this, let me alone. Now, come on. God is being held back by Moses? Really? God, almighty God, all-powerful God, is being held back by Moses? He says, now let me alone. Let me do this. I don't think so. I don't think Moses is the one holding God back. I think God is testing Moses here. He says, Moses, let me do this, let me alone, right, that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them and I will make of thee a great nation. Moses, are you still full of yourself? And that you would want to be a great nation when God has already said this people are his God's already said these people are mine this is this is my people does God have to get permission to do anything of course not he's testing Moses to see if he will think only of himself or if he will truly think of the promises that God had for Israel and put himself to the side so that God's purpose can be done. God says, Moses, this is what they've done. They're stiff necked people. Let me punish them. And I will take you and make out of you a great nation. Do you remember what we saw in Psalms 106, verse 23? Therefore he said he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. Think of even how God started this back in verse number 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down for thy people, which thou broughtest up out of the land of Egypt. Were they really Moses' people? Did Moses really do anything to bring them out? Of course not. But here's what had happened. The people had started looking to Moses and equating Moses with God. And God is testing Moses to see, is this what's happening to you? Are are you being so filled with pride that you think that these are your people, that you think that you really did this? Again, that's what they said, for Moses is the one that brought us out of Egypt. Moses is the one that did these things. Now, Moses, let me find out, do you really think what they're saying of you? Do you really think that you are somebody special? And here's the test. He says, I'll destroy them, and I'll make a great nation out of you. No doubt God was going to bring judgment on them, as we see. But would Moses simply stand aside and do nothing? Or would he stand in the gap for these people? Do you realize that no doubt there's judgment coming upon this world? There is judgment coming, not just on our country, although that's coming too. 
For there's judgment coming on this world. And I believe God is asking this question. Do you think you're someone special? That you would just, hey, I'm a Christian. I know I'm going to heaven, so all right, God, go ahead. Pour out, go ahead, do it. Go ahead, pour out your judgment. It's okay with me. Ha, I mean, I'm going to heaven after all. I, I've put my faith in Christ. I know where I'm going when I die, so go ahead, God. Just go ahead. Or are you willing to stand in the gap and say, God, wait, wait, God. I know judgment is going to come. And I know judgment needs to come, but God, there are some who will still believe. There are some who will still put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So God, would you just hold off your judgment for a little bit longer? Lord, would you let me stand in the gap and say, God, I'll do whatever you need me to do. Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. If you'll just hold your judgment off a little bit longer so that we can reach more people. Lord, would you let me Stand in the gap. He said that he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. So here's the test. God says, Moses, who do you think you are? Do you think just because I've chosen you to lead Israel that that makes you someone special? Do you think that you're really the one that brought them out of Egypt? Do you think that you're really something? Because he did at one time. He thought that. God says, all right, how about now? And I want you to notice the third thing. Look at his answer. It's just amazing. When you look at his answer, and Moses besought the Lord, his God, and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and thy, uh, they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Look at the answer that Moses gives. God says, all right, here's the test, Moses. Are you just going to stand aside and let judgment come on this people, or are you going to stand in the gap and do what is right and plead for God's mercy on this nation? Now watch his answer. He gives three different things here. In verse number 11, notice he says, they are not my people. They are yours. Remember, this is what he said back in, at the beginning of chapter 32. The children of Israel said, what? This is the man that brought us out of Egypt, right? And then even as we see that, the God said, your people, right? Your people. And what's Moses saying? Lord, they're not my people. What do we find? We find an, a heart of humility. Before, it was all about Moses. Now Moses says, Lord, it's not about me. It's about you. Did you notice how many times he references the Lord here? He says, uh, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought up out of Egypt? He said, God, I didn't have anything to do with it. I didn't have anything to do with it. There was nothing that I did. I just simply did what you told me to do, and you did it. How often do we think because we're saved that we're someone special? And yet we did nothing to earn salvation. We did nothing to ever merit the grace and the mercy of God. God just simply said, hey, it's a free gift offered freely for all who choose to accept it. Moses said, I didn't bring them out, Lord, you did. He said, I have no power. You have the power. He says at the end of the verse, which thou broughtest forth out of the land of Egypt with great power. God said, Moses says, God, it was your power, not mine. I didn't do this. God, this is not about me. It's about you. Look what he says in verse number 12. 
not only do we see his humility, but we also see his desire for God's glory. Look in verse number 12. He says, Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out and to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? He says, God, if you do this, people are going to, people are going to laugh and they're going to mock. And instead, we want people to recognize the glory of God. We want people to say, God is amazing. God is great. There's no one like our God. And so he says, God, if, if you do this, then, then they're going to they're gonna mock and they're going to laugh and say, look, he delivered these people just to take them out into the wilderness to destroy them. What type of a God is that? And he says, God, please don't do this because of your name. We want your name to be glorified, not my name. It's not about Moses, God. It's about you. I wonder, do we have that same attitude that, God, this is not about me. It's not about my life. But God, in my life, I want you to be glorified. God, in all that is done, I want you to be glorified. And this is what Moses is saying. Lord, what about your glory? Do we truly desire the glory of God in our life and in all that we do? And I want you to notice the third thing here. In his answer, in verse number 13. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Thy servants to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. You know what he did? He trusted God. He went back to the promises of God. He said, God, you promised. You promised this. By the way, let me tell you something. You don't have to remind God of, your prom- of his promises. God doesn't forget his promise. But this, we just see Moses' answer in this test that God is giving him. Moses, is this going to be about you or is it going to be about me? Is it going to be you're the man or is it going to be about God? And he says, Lord, it's not about me. I want all the glory to go back to you. And God, I remember your promise that you gave to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. You promised yourself, God, you promised that you would bring them into the promised land and and they would have a nation here forever, God. You promised, and so God, I'm gonna trust in your promises. I don't know what's gonna come. I don't know what's gonna happen in the future, but God, you promised this, and so I'm gonna trust you. And what do we find? God says, I'm gonna bring judgment upon Israel and Moses instead of just standing to the side and say, all right, God, go ahead. Yeah, they deserve it. I mean, these people, I can't believe. They're always murmuring. They're always complaining. I mean, God, I, I... I I say go for it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, oh, and you're going to make a nation out of me. Well, that's even better. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, God. Absolutely. You need some help? I'll be glad to help. No? No? Okay. But instead, there's a gap between God and the people. And instead of just standing to the side, Moses says, God, no, no. Please, it's about you. It's not about me. It's not about the people. It's about you. Moses was willing to stand in the gap before God. Did God still bring judgment? Sure, he did. There was still judgment that came. But because Moses was willing to stand in the gap, The judgment was not as severe. God didn't just totally wipe out the entire nation of Israel and just start with Moses. Because one man was willing to stand in the gap and say, God, it's not about me. It has nothing to do with me. God, I want your glory to be seen by all of those around us. God, I want the Egyptians to see who you are and to see how great your power is and to say there is no God like this God no other God God I remember your promises you promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob you'd make a great nation out of them not me Moses stands in the gap and God says that if it was not for Moses Again, I don't know what God would have done afterwards. 
But we see this test of Moses saying, Moses, is it going to be about you or is it going to be about me? You know, when we have these men and women who are willing to fight and to serve our country, you know what we find out about them? That it's not about them. It's not about them. That's why they're willing to go. That's why they're willing to serve because it's not about them. They're concerned about us. May I say what God is looking for today is men and women who are willing to stand in the gap and say, God, it's not about me. God, it's about you. And it's about the souls of millions of people who still do not know your son, Jesus Christ. And God, I'll stand in the gap. God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll say whatever you want me to say if that's what it takes to reach one more person so that they don't have to experience the judgment of God. Are you willing to stand in the gap? Fathers, are you willing to stand in the gap for your families? Say, it's not going to be about me, but it's going to be about my family and making sure they know the Lord and making sure they have a heart for God. Christian, is your life just about you? Unfortunately, I, I believe that that's the way so many Christians are living their lives that it's all about me. It's all about me and what I want and what I desire. And we fail the test. We say, God, go ahead. Hey, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I don't care what happens. Oh, we should. We should care what happens because we are talking about people's eternal destiny. Neither heaven or hell. And we have an opportunity to stand in the gap before God and say, God, would you give us just a little bit more time? God, would you give us just a little bit more time so that we can reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ? God, would you hold your judgment just a little bit longer? We know it's coming, but God, would you hold it back just a little bit longer so that more people and come to know Christ. Who is going to stand in the gap? Moses said, I'll stand in the gap. Later on in Israel's history, we find this. In Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse number 30, God is speaking. And he says, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. He's looking for the same thing. And this is what he says, but I found none. I found none. No one to stand in the gap. No Moses to stand in the gap. Who's going to stand in the gap today? Because there's a great gap. And there's a great need for Christian men and women to stand in the gap and say, God, would you hold off your judgment for a little bit longer? A little bit longer. I heard this quote. The world at its worst needs the church at its best. Church, that's us. We have to be willing to stand in the gap and make up the gap that is in the hedge. We know judgment's coming, but there are still men and women and young people that need to hear about Jesus Christ. Who'll stand in the gap? Is it going to all be about you? My life, my will, my desires? Or will we have the answer of Moses and say, God, it's not about me. I have no power. But God, I want your name to be glorified. And I know your promise says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved.
So God, would you hold off your judgment a little bit longer so more can be those whosoevers that come to know Christ. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. God, I pray that you would help us as Christians to realize the dire need that we have today for Christians to stand in the gap between God and a lost and dying world. Lord, Moses knew that judgment was going to come. Many still died of judgment. But there was a man who was willing to stand in the gap and do all he could for the honor and glory of God so that men and women and young people could escape the judgment of God. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to have that desire to stand in the gap, that it would not be about ourselves. It's not about me. Lord, salvation did not come by anything that I have ever done or ever will do. Lord, salvation was a free gift that you offered through the death, burial, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, would you help us to realize there is a gap and judgment is coming and we need Christians to stand in the gap and say, Oh God, would you hold off judgment for a little bit longer? Would you use us for your honor and for your glory so that others can know about the greatness of God? That They would come to put their faith and trust in Him. This morning, maybe God is speaking to your hearts, with their heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe there's something that God is speaking to your heart about. Maybe God's wanting you to stand in the gap for your family, your home, your church, your country, a lost and dying world. Who We'll stand in the gap. Let's all stand quietly with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. No one looking about. The piano is just going to play softly. Maybe God has spoken to your heart this morning. Who will stand in the gap? Say, God, it's not about me. It's about you. God, I want your glory to be seen. I want people to know that you are a great and awesome God so that they too can know you. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I'm not even sure if I died today if I would go to heaven. I don't know that. I'd like to. I'd like to know if I died that I could go to heaven, but I'm not sure. My friend, we'd love to take the Word of God, not our opinion, but God's Word, and show you how you can be absolutely certain that when you die, you can be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. So how do you know that? Because God's promised it in His Word. And God never breaks a promise. You can trust Him. you trust Him? Israel had a problem. Instead of keeping their eyes on the Lord, they put it on a man. They put it on an idol. Are we truly trusting Him even though we may not be able to see Him? He said, God, I trust You. I'm willing to give You my life to do whatever You want with it. Who will stand in the gap? Sad four words, but I found none.
Amen. God bless you for being here today. Well, if you would just be seated, we have just a short video announcement uh, that we'll show, and then we'll come back and dismiss. We are so glad you were able to join us today. Here are a few announcements to let you know about upcoming events here at First Baptist Church. Join us for our annual Pie and Praise service on Tuesday night, November the 24th at 7 p.m. This special evening includes singing, giving of testimonies, and a devotional, followed by a fellowship around pies and other desserts. Bring a pie to share and invite friends and family to enjoy our pie and praise service. We all know that sleep is very valuable, unless you have an overnight event with the church teens. On Friday, November 13th, the FBC teens will have their overnight activity here at the church where they will be doing their best to stay up all night by playing games, eating snacks, and participating in devotional time. Jake and Leanna Naus can help you with any questions. Parents, we know that it is hard to find time to get away and just spend time with your spouse. On November 20th, from 5 to 9.30 p.m., the teens will be hosting the Parents' Night Out. For a few hours, the teens will be watching your kids while you have an evening with your spouse. For more information, please speak to Jake or Leanna Naus. Missions Conference is one of our favorite weeks of the year. It starts on Sunday, November 15th, and ends Wednesday the 18th. We will be hearing from multiple missionaries, including Dwight Tomlinson, the founder of the Barnabas 1040 Project. Mark it on your calendar now because you won't want to miss it. Thank you so much for attending First Baptist Church. We hope our services were a blessing to you and that you received encouragement from the Word of God. Don't forget to visit our church website and Facebook page to stay up to date on upcoming events. We can't wait to see you again at our next service. Amen. So just a few things to keep, uh, be aware of there. I know they said to bring a pie and share it, but why would you want to share a pie? You know, I mean, like bring one for yourself and then one for, you know, to share maybe, but uh, uh, no, we'll have a good time that night. Also, don't forget, we do have uh, the Christmas invites. We have our Christmas program that we'll have this year uh, on December 12th and the 13th, the Saturday night and a Sunday night uh, at 6 p.m. And so please take those, invite someone to come to that. Uh, maybe they wouldn't be able to come to uh, Sunday, but maybe they can come to Saturday. Uh, so invite someone uh, to those, and we look forward to a good uh, program for that as well. All right, let's go ahead and be, let's stand together, and we'll be dismissed in word of prayer. I encourage you to be back tonight, 6 o'clock, and uh, I've asked my dad to preach tonight, and uh, just to kind of maybe give us some preparation as far as our missions conference and things coming up. And so I encourage you to be back uh, this evening. Uh, and then also tonight is the Master Club Award Service, and uh, young people will be getting uh, some different awards, and so that's always an exciting night to see them uh, get all the different badges and awards and stuff like that. So uh, remember, that will be tonight as well, so make sure you have your, uh, your young people here and uh, as they get those awards tonight, all right? Well, let's go ahead and be dismissed in a word of prayer uh, this morning and just thank the Lord for what he's done. Uh, Brother Brian Stinson, would you dismiss us in prayer, please?